Itäpinä, sunny day, winter day in Helsinki, a nice day. I was just hanging around with my friends, chatting, when people around us started running. I wasn't sure where they were going or why, but I started running too. Then I saw someone lying on the ground. Oh my god, it's Nasir, I thought. I held his hand as we waited for an ambulance. Little by little, I understood what had happened. Nasir had climbed up a tree and tried to hang himself. He had come to Finland as an asylum seeker, and that morning he had been thrown out from his refugee camp, and he had nowhere to go. No hope. For him, it was life-changing. And for me, as a, as a friend and a human rights advocate, it was a defining moment. It's only about two years since I became a human rights advocate. I had been researching migration for many years, but when more people started arriving to Europe, I realized this is what I had been studying for. So when the, when the so-called refugee crisis unfolded, I was in Greece, receiving the boats and distributing what was needed in the refugee camps. Seeking, seeking asylum means leaving behind everything you've ever known. Your, whole, your house, your belongings, maybe even your family. You do it because there's no way going back. But what's keep you, what keeps you going is the hope that maybe you find a place where you can walk safely on the street. Say, speak freely what's on your mind and love whoever you choose. A place where there is justice and rights and future and hope. In 2015, also Finland, my home country, started seeing more asylum applications. I've always thought that Finland is a place of equality and human rights. And I also saw it in practice when people opened, regular people opened their homes and their hearts to those who needed it the most. Not everybody was welcoming the newcomers, though. We started hearing more and more that the asylum seekers only came to Finland for a holiday, that they only came to collect our social benefits and take our women. Then we started hearing that something strange was going on with the asylum decisions, that people who would have been previously granted asylum were now denied it. Even brothers who had similar cases the one who came first was given asylum, and the other who came maybe a month later was denied it. Shores is a political activist from Iran. He had given up Islam and was working to make Iran a democratic state, separating the state and religion, and also pushing to make Kurdistan autonomous. This is a really dangerous working in, in Iran. And like many others working to make Iran more equal, he was caught by the secret police and tortured for many days. When he got out, the secret police was still after him. So when he came to Finland, his case to get asylum should have been a strong one. He ticked all the boxes that are required to be granted asylum. Still, he was denied it. Finland replied to the people coming in by making its laws more strict. The changes didn't feel that big at first, just a little tweak here and a little tweak there. But the effects were drastic. You see her? what happened to the percentage of asylums given to Iraqis when the changes were made. The number of asylums granted went 
from 80% in 2015 to only 16% in mid-2016. These changes were accompanied uh, by changes in the way uh, asylum decisions were made. Research shows that the asylum decisions were sloppy, poorly justified, and based on insufficient country information. Hassan used to work in the Iraqi army as a cook. When he had his interview at the Finnish Immigration Service, he had to rely on an interpreter because he didn't speak much Finnish. The interpreter translated that he had been given special military training. The Immigration Service concluded that it was unlikely that he had been working in the army as a cook after being given special military training. That made his whole story sound illogical and unreliable and he was denied asylum. Both the Immigration Service and Hassan's lawyer failed to notice this crucial mistake in translation. Aisha came to Finland because her father, Ahmed, and the whole family had been threatened. Ahmed's persecutors had told him that if they can't get him, they will get one of his family. Specifically, they had said that they will catch his wife or his daughter and rape and kill them. When the decision from the immigration service came, Ahmed, his wife and all the underage children were given asylum, but Aisha was not, because she was over 18 and therefore no longer considered part of the family in Finland. Shores, the political advocate from Iran, who had been tortured by the secret police, was also denied asylum. The Immigration Service said that, he's, he, that the Immigration Service did not believe that he had been tortured, because the way he talked about it was not, was not detailed and emotional enough. Psychologists say that this is very common when torture victims talk about what happened to them. The memories are so horrible that their minds don't let the people revisit them. They, it just hurts too much. The immigration service did believe, however, that Therese had left Islam, but they said that it was still safe for him to go back to the theocratic Iran because Iran had not executed that many people for religious reasons in the past couple of years. In 2016, out of all the countries in the world, Iran was, number, was the second in the number of executions carried out. The number of faulty asylum decisions in Finland has, become has increased by 20 times in just two years. When the decisions first started rolling in, the idealists in me wanted to think that it's just a mistake. That is because of the inexperienced staff it's, and because of the unforeseen rush in processing these applications. And if we just bring these problems into light, they will be fixed. That wasn't the case. Instead, the decision makers, decision makers told us not to worry. Everything is okay. Yes, some mistakes have been made, but they have been corrected and nobody is sent back if it's not safe for them to return. Originally, this was supposed to be a two-person talk. I was supposed to talk with my friend Daniel, who came to Finland as an asylum seeker in 2015. When I first asked him to do this talk with me, he said, yes, 
I'll do it. We knew that this kind of publicity could be dangerous for him. So we planned to take all the precautions needed to keep his identity hidden. But in the end, he still decided that it was too dangerous for him to talk because the persecutors are still after him and his family. Meanwhile, Finnish Immigration Service says that it's safe for him to return home. If someone would have told me three years ago that this is what's happening in Finland right now, I wouldn't have believed it. Because this is Finland, you know? Things like this are not supposed to happen in this clean, neat and humane country. That moment when I sat by Hassan, after he had just tried to hang himself, I'm sorry, that moment when I sat by Nazir as he had just tried to kill himself. It showed me all the disbelief and desperation that our immigration politics are causing. This is the crisis. But maybe even more important was what happened afterwards. People expressed their condolences that Nazir had not succeeded in killing himself. One police officer wrote online, they are not good even at that. They wished Nasir had died. Opening your eyes to these things can be really painful. It was for me. For years I looked at these things from a removed theoretical perspective. But now I've come to see the human side of it. The disappointment and disbelief when somebody, some official, tells you it's safe to go back when you know it's not. And the desperation when there's no, no place to go. Still, I wouldn't change it for a thing. Working with asylum seekers has been the most amazing, horrible, heartbreaking, and the most important thing I've ever done. A few weeks ago, on a sunny Wednesday, Aisha, the daughter of Ahmed, was granted asylum. Her decision had been deemed faulty, and almost after a year later than, the, than her family, she finally got it. She got her asylum. But on that very same day, Hassan, the army cook, was deported. We found the translation errors in his process too late. And he never got a proper asylum process. It was horrible. But what keeps me going is knowing that he was not deported without anyone noticing or caring. Maybe you're now asking yourselves, what happened to Nazir, who tried to hang himself? What happened to Shores, the political advocate who had been tortured by the Iranian secret police? What happened to Daniel, who was supposed to stand next to me today? This is the very same question each and every one of them and countless others in Europe are asking themselves every hour of every day. What will happen to me and to my loved ones? This is the crisis. Closing your eyes to these things doesn't make the injustice go away. In fact, it's quite the opposite. When too many people close their eyes, that 
that allows the injustice to continue. The first step in, train, in making the change is to see it. Please, open your eyes. Thank you.